everybody, and thank you for joining us for the second episode of the Shine Sparkers podcast. My name is Amanda Van Heil. I'll be your host today, and I also have with us a special guest, as well as a few other Shine Sparkers team members. Hey there, I'm Darren. I'm the founder of Shine Sparkers, and I like to get involved in everything that's going on on the website and in the Metroid community. Hi, I'm Roy, and I'm the second in command at Shine Sparkers. So, whenever Darren isn't available or he needs an extra hand, uh, I'm available to help out with getting our content on site and whatever projects we're working on, such as this podcast. And we also have a very special guest with us, Maserati. Hello, I'm a freelance musician. I'm Christopher Keith, also known as Maserati. I've worked in a couple of studios as a recording keyboardist and composer, as well as worked on various short films and series online. I'm mostly known for my video game remixes on my YouTube channel and a couple of Overclock remix albums, and of course the Shine Sparker albums, which I've had the honor of sharing a few of my tunes alongside some very amazing talent, so I'm happy to be here. It's, uh, it's great to have you on the podcast, Maserati. Um, gosh, it's been so long since we did the first Harmony of a Hunter. It's almost um, been 10 years already. The, almost <laughs> 10 years, it's amazing. Um, and I was actually listening to Harmony of a Hunter earlier, and uh, just before the podcast, and I was listening to some of the music that you uh, put together, and it really does hold up, uh, especially uh, Hostile Shadows. Uh, which I believe at the time we, we talked about the different music from Metro Prime 2 Echoes mm -hmm. and each of the uh, bosses. And I think at the time people wasn't taking those tracks. So I think in a sort of attempt to try and get them featured on the album, I asked you to put together a sort of uh, a mashup of different uh, tracks and you did a really good job. Um, but yes, there was five tracks in total. I believe we had Desperation and Hostile Shadows from the first uh, Harmony of a Hunter, and then for 101% run, we had Incoming Crade, and you also did some teaser music for one of our trailers. Mm -hmm. And then I believe in Harmony of Heroes, you also did uh, Adventures in the Greenest Greens, which was a Kirby track, uh, which was fantastic. Um, do you have any memories or thoughts of those tracks from back then? Uh, I think Desperation was the first track I worked on, if I remember right. And it came together so quickly that I think that's why I ended up taking another track. Um, I've always hated my mix downs, even to this day. I'm still struggling with so much of it. Because there's a lot of tutorials out there for like EDM or rock or orchestra. But not all three of them put together. Yes. So, uh, And then there was also a spell checker that incorrected, incorrectly labeled it Desperation with an A. For, oh, I see. Right. It was like yeah, that for a while. I think on the final release, we, we actually had Yeah, you guys caught that, thankfully, so before it was good. released. <laughs> that was embarrassing. It'd be, a bit, it'd be a bit embarrassing if we didn't notice 10 yeah. years later, but uh, I'm glad you pointed that one out. <laughs> um, yeah. But yes, with Desperation in particular, I, I really liked, because um, when I was looking for someone to cover that track, I, I really liked the theme, and I wanted to find someone that could do it justice. And uh, I'm happy to say that all these years later, you certainly did it justice. It was definitely... The correct approach brings a smile to my heart <laughs> <laughs> um but yes well, was there any other thoughts from back then of any other tracks that you uh, that you worked on uh hostile shadows was a beast mm. i mean it was kind of like a boss rush and i wanted it to be dark and heavy and felt that i could string them together and yet still be instantly identifiable because you know there's a lot of people that really love that music even though it wasn't a series i grew up on like the mm -hmm. older ones because I'm an old fogey now. Well, yeah, because I think you, inc you <laughs> um, incorporated, I think it was a Morbis, the Chica, the, um, was, it, was it Quadraxis? Um, and I think Emperor Ing as well went into that. There was a, there was a lot mm -hmm. of a lot of tracks there, uh, but it flowed really well. I probably could have I could have spent more time on the different sections, but it already ended up being a seven-minute long, long song, so I don't think we needed it I mean, worse. some of the tracks we've had on the and... albums have gone way more than that i think we've had like 13 or 15 minute tracks um but i also <laughs> if i remember true. correctly we were also pushed for time because we were trying to get the first album out for the 25th anniversary of metroid so mm -hmm. uh yeah obviously you know there's things that we could have changed or done better but you know on reflection i think we did a really good job um so thank you very much for that it's really really appreciated 
Absolutely. I do remember I was pretty much all done and ready sub to submit, and you talked me into because we still had a little bit of time left of putting in Drax's. Oh, that's right. Yes, I remember so that. Everybody yeah. can think. Yeah. Everybody can thank Darren for having that extra <laughs> section. In the last I forget minute. little things like this because obviously back then I'm speaking to so many musicians all at the same time and desperately trying to oh, get yes. as many tracks in there to give it the, you know, the attention and, and love that it deserves and trying to get as many tracks in there as possible uh, for all the fans because obviously there's fans of all different kinds of Metroid games. Um, so the fact that we was able to get those in there uh, was was a bit of a miracle really um, because it's. Uh, <laughs> it's it's a difficult thing to do um i'm i'm nowhere i mean i like to sing but i can't compose music i can't arrange music but uh so i've got this this i'm a huge fanboy for anyone that can really um so you've done done a good job um and i'm sure uh lots of people agree i constantly see comments from people all the time uh even now talking about how uh how much they loved your music so yeah mm -hmm. well done well, Maserati, would you tell us about some of what you've worked on since um, Harmony of a Hunter? Because you've done some really great stuff uh, as far as gaming is concerned and done all these great, great pieces. Um, what is some other stuff you've worked on? I know you m mentioned it briefly, but could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I've, uh, I've done several different projects. Most of them never came to fruition because of one reason or the other. Usually budget reasons, but um, so most of the stuff I've been up to, I can't really talk about. But I've done uh, a series called Paired, which was a Lego animated series that was from a fellow that was quite young when he started. And he's kept me on board since about the third episode or something like that. And he just finished this last year after, goodness, what was it, nine years he's been working on the thing. <laughs> so, um, and uh, I have did the music for Elias Thompson's show, which... Is a fellow I'm sure most of you guys know. Elias is one of We're my very best familiar. friends. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> I tolerate yeah, Elias, but, but yes. <laughs> Elias tolerates me. <laughs> I also did the Overclock remix. I believe I probably should have looked this up first, but I believe it's called the uh, In the Darkness and the Light, which was a Secret of Mana three. I guess it's called Trials of Mana now, <laughs> since the the re releases. That was a fan album with quite a few songs on there. I did two of them, and one of them was actually done way back in 2008, 2007. So that is a really old song for something that just got released a couple of years ago. But um, I feel like I remember it when had that one such, came out too. I remember that album. <clears throat> it had such intricate guitar work that uh, I had some others looking for me to do guitar work on their end. And what they didn't understand is a lot of that stuff is a lot of digital trickery because I can play a little bit of guitar, but not nearly enough to be able to do all those crazy solos and such. And they were adamant that I had to play an actual guitar and not do any of the digital trickeries. Needless to say, none of those tracks were used. But it was still fun to work with. It, it made me learn guitar a little more. What instruments do you play? Almost everything is just my keyboard. That's cool. That's really Which cool. has been different setups over the years. Thank you so much, Maserati, again, for talking with us about your involvement on Harmony of a Hunter and all of what you've done in the past, as well as just the challenges you've faced along the way with working with not a guitar as opposed to using a keyboard and trying to use a guitar and all of that and just the, the different challenges musicians have to face. All right, so I have a question for all of you. What do you feel is the future for the direction of the Metroid franchise? Darren, you're the king of the website. Oh, have you okay. started? <laughs> right, so it is something that I've thought about uh, for a while. Like, where do we want to go next with the Metroid franchise? And as we know, Retro Studios are currently, at the time of recording, uh, creating the next Metroid Prime game, Metroid Prime 4. Um, which is fantastic. It's great that it's back in the hands of the people that worked on the original trilogy. They're timeless classics. They have a lot of love in the Metroid community. Um, however, I also hope that we do see another traditional side-scrolling Metroid game again. Um, 
Samus Returns clearly proved that that is a fantastic concept that works today. Um, and I'm sure that if Mercury Steam was to take on another title, they would do an amazing job. However, I want to make sure uh, that I'm clear here when I say this, that as much as I'd love one of those, I do not want to see another remake of something. Um, so I don't want to see a Fusion remake or you know, definitely not a Super Metroid remake. I just want to see a brand new game taking place after the events of Metroid Fusion, uh, Metroid Dread, if you want to call it that. That's definitely something that I think a lot of people would want to see. It's been nearly 18 years since Fusion was released, and I think it's definitely time to see a brand new continuation of that story. So I hope that that happens. That, for me, is where the future of Metroid needs to go. I am definitely excited about Metroid Prime 4. I really want to see just the, the big budget, high graphics of a new Metroid game. But I'm also, with, with Darren here, there is definitely a demand for more side scrollers, especially like with games like Hollow Knight and Ori and the Blind Forest. We're definitely seeing that that's still what fans really enjoy. And also that side scroller style of, of Metroid, I mean, that created its own genre. So I could easily see a new one coming out. And yeah, I mean, it would be great to have something that's not a remake. Because um, we saw that recently, like with A Link Between Worlds and versus uh, A Link's Awakening. Um, you know, it's a remake, but it's still that same style. And I would love to see just another Metroid game that follows that same formula and same style, but completely new a new story taking place later on i think that's definitely something we could we could see but i think the big thing is just metroid prime 4 happening and that's what we're all waiting for but there is certainly a demand and i'm glad that independent studios are making a lot of side scrollers doing the metroidvania style games because it's showing bigger studios that that's what people want to play yeah amanda like you said um i think prime 4 is going to be amazing for um you know multiple reasons obviously we're going to have another prime game but as you said uh an entire new generation of fans will get to experience it for the first time and we'll get to see our favorite games you know with modern technology and and with gameplay enhancements i can't wait to see what new mechanics they're going to introduce um I don't want another remake either. I think that if they try to remake Super Metroid, it, that one shouldn't be touched. You know, it's timeless. It's still, it still holds up to this day. I think that if they're going to do anything, they should just do maybe like an uh, an HD port with like enhanced graphics or maybe different controls, but not a full remake. Uh, and the same for Fusion. That one could use better audio. The next uh, 2D Metroid game should happen after Fusion. It should tie. It should continue the story of Fusion. Uh, I'd like to see it with Samus Returns graph style uh, gameplay and graphics, and with some expanded gameplay with the power of the Switch, because it should not be on 3DS anymore. I think at this point the 3DS is uh, discontinued. I think. I don't think we're going to see a, another game on that. As much as I would love to see one, because the two, di you know, the two screens are fantastic. Just to have the map always on one screen while you're playing along, I think, is a really good idea. But unfortunately, yeah. that that probably won't happen this time. Yeah, the 3DS, I think, at this point, is a zombie. Some some developers might be supporting it, but overall, it's pretty much done for. I don't know where Metroid Prime Four is at. In the development stage, it seems like they're taking a lot of time for it, so I'm hoping that's more about getting everything perfect than it is some really big problem that they have to keep restarting. Because that usually ends up being not so good. Great vocabulary Thanks, there. Duke yeah. Nukem forever. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like the rest of you. I think a Fusion sequel is probably the best place to take a Metroidvania attempt i'm i'm curious if they'll do a 2d 
you know, pixel art or if they'll do like a 2.5D with 3D. I'm not really a fan of that for side scrollers because there's a lot of chaos that can happen in it and it just never feels as uh, tight as traditional pixels go. But I can see that, you know, there's a lot of, especially on the Switch, there's a lot of people that are more toward the 3D elements than they are the old school 2D. But there's room for both. There's room for both. I still believe that. <laughs> Well, we do have a few mailbag questions for this episode. Our first one is from Griffin Olney. The question is, what would be the best way for newcomers to get into the series? Um, for me, I would say Super Metroid would be a good start. I would not recommend starting off with the very first one because that's just kind of difficult. Um, but Super Metroid is, is a good good starting point because that at least gives you an idea as to the roots of the series and then um i'm gonna say probably just metroid prime maybe would be the next good spot um i'd say start at super metroid just to get a solid foundation yeah i, I would agree with what you said there i also think with super metroid as well because the introduction actually tells you briefly the story of the previous two games as well so you also have that introduction there and i think you've got the very best of the traditional side scrolling metroid games with super metroid so that's a really good way in and if you already have a switch and nintendo online uh you can play that straight away for free because it's available as part of nintendo online so that's a really good uh, a, a good opportunity. I think uh, I also agree with you. I think Metroid Prime would be the best way of experiencing the uh, the three D games, uh, possibly as part of the Metroid Prime trilogy. I think uh, that is maybe something. If you can pick that up, that is something that I would recommend because using the motion controls, in my opinion, is the best way of experiencing that game. Um, so yeah, I would say those two games would be best. I'll also just touch as well quickly when you said about the original Metroid not holding up. That's why if you are going to play that game, I would recommend Zero Mission. I think that's a much better uh, telling of that story. I'm in agreement with you. Um, if you're going to experience the original story, uh, then you shouldn't bother with the very first game. You should go with Zero Mission because it ties up the story in a much more enhanced way enhanced obviously because of you know increased technology but it expands the story and it introduces the universe of metroid as well as the gameplay that we've come to know and love and i think it's a bit more accessible for uh, new players than super metroid might be if you're for uh, newcomers to the 3d games the first prime is the definitely the first way to go because of uh, how it again laid out the foundation for the later entries and um, it's a bit easier I think I'm pretty much in agreement with you guys too uh, I don't think there's a wrong place to start with maybe the exception of the one that shall not be named but Federation Force <laughs> too. <laughs> but uh there's really two different styles of play. You've got the 2D and the 3D, and I think it's best to start with whichever feels more comfortable to dive into. But Super Metroid and Metroid Prime seem like the, pardon the pun, the prime choice to start. And Smash Brothers. <laughs> Smash Brothers, yeah. I think that's how a lot of people tend to get into Metroid anyway. Yes. I think that's like the entry point, isn't it? It was for me. Uh, it was Nelly. for me too. Yeah. And me. I think for a lot of people it was, which is great, because, again, it, probably the same for a lot of other franchises as well. I think Fire Emblem, Smash Brothers yes. is more of yeah. a uh, uh, an advertisement, really, for other franchises. That's how I learned about Fire Emblem, that's how I learned about Metroid, that's how I learned about Earthbound. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Smash Bros. is a great way to, it's a, it's a gateway game. <laughs> it is, yeah. I was about to say. We should definitely put a podcast together on that topic at some point for sure. Oh my gosh, I can, that can be our yes. next topic. That'll be next episode. 
If you all want to hear an episode of that, let us know and we'll make it happen. Sound like such a YouTuber there. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we have one more mailbag question. This is from Porvia Art. The question is, I love how Metroid games guide the player wordlessly with an invisible hand. Do you experience this as well? And what are your views on subtle player influences like this in game design? Um, so the cool thing about how it would guide players with an invisible hand, that sort of thing came about in early games due to just restraints on or constraints I don't know what the word is um I'll try that again that using like an invisible hand to guide players really came along in early games just because there was only so much they could do technologically there wasn't a way of them just to go hey over here over here this is where you go here's a little a little dot follow this dot and you get there um and so it made things a bit more intuitive, and it also made it feel like you were figuring things out a little bit better. Um, so I definitely get what they're saying there, and I've seen it in other games, and don't see it as much anymore because games don't depend on it um, as a way to, to get through. They have ways of just saying, of just spelling it out for you what you need to do now. And I think a really good example of this sort of invisible hand is Super Metroid. Because Super Metroid not only guides you where you need to go naturally, um, with there isn't any tutorials, there's no spoken dialogue, there's no, there's no written dialogue, um, but you learn where to go because there's certain things that you need to do with certain uh, items, for example, um, that helps you progress. Um, also, like there's certain pauses on doors where you can't just go into a room and then straight out. You, you've got to focus on the room. I think one in particular is the gold statue chamber. You know that this is a place that you need to come back to and you sort of take it in. Um, so I think, yeah, Super Metroid, I would describe it as it's, it's storytelling without the use of words and uh, any kind of narrative. And I think it's a really good example of what you described there, Porvia. All right, Roy? Yeah, um, I agree. Super Metroid is probably the pinnacle of show, don't tell, or guiding the player with an invisible hand. One of the problems, or um, maybe not problems, but uh, something that the later games in the Metroid series kind of abandon is the invisible hand. They Some of them do... Uh, some... In some cases, it is a bit optional. Like, you can turn off the hint system in the primes, or uh, zero mission, you don't have to use the Chozo statues that tell you where items are. So, you know, a lot of modern games are loaded with tutorials, and I like how uh, Super Metroid or um, some other games kind of have hidden tutorials, like you know, whenever you pick up an item in Metroid, you have to use it immediately after in order to get out. Like, like in the first Prime, when you're going through that Morph Ball maze to get to the Power Bombs, once you get them, you have to uh, use them to destroy an obstruction that will let you get out of the room. Stuff like that is really intelligent, and it makes the player think, and it's better than simply throwing a bunch of text in their face, uh, telling them what to do. Maserati, what are your thoughts? I think Roy brought up an excellent point, that the the games out there, a lot of them do have too big of a tutorial that it can even take you out of the game experience entirely. And a lot of the classics, especially in the NES and Super Nintendo days, they basically made the first level or the first section a tutorial, and then they they progressively add things to the game so that you're never overwhelmed at any point. You know what each item is supposed to do, largely because of, like Roy said, you immediately have to use it, and there's your tutorial. You're ready to go. That's that guiding hand. And you could almost call most of the Metroid games an open-world game, with the exception that they do want you to travel a certain path, and it makes sense that you do this path. It never springs in your mind that this doesn't make any sense of why I'm doing this. <laughs> 
Now, we've talked about where we would like to see the Metroid series go or where we think it may go, but we want to know what you guys think. So what do you think is going to be the future of the Metroid series? Use hashtag ShineSpikers on Twitter or comment on our Facebook page for the post for episode two. Well, that is all for our second episode of the Shine Sparkers podcast. We really thank you guys for listening. Maserati, where can people find you and all of the work you've done? I've sadly kind of gotten away from social media, so my Facebook and Twitter is just kind of sitting there these days. But uh, you can certainly find me on uh, YouTube under Maserati, M-O-Z-Z-A-R-A-T-T-I. And there's just a whole bunch of stuff on there. And lately I'm doing a fighting game versus series of just random fighting game stuff that i pick out but i do do requests so if you have an idea for something especially if it's metroid just let me know well thank you so much again maserati for joining us we're so happy you were able to come and talk with us today happy to be here and thank you so much for listening and we will see you next mission bye see you next mission bye see you all later have a very special guest with us today but let's go on ahead and see who else we have on the panel i just said panel i'm so used to doing panels oh my gosh (laughs) (laughs) doing conventions oh doing conventions two weeks in a row with back-to-back conventions and panels and all that like it just used to saying panel oh that's okay (laughs) okay i think that was a good clap (laughs) i think it was an excellent clap all righty the clap to end all claps. <laughs> hey there, I'm Darren. I am the founder of Shine Sparkers, and I get involved in everything on the website uh, from interviews, uh, podcasts, and uh, introducing guests like Maserati. Um, which will be, never mind, scrap that, that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Forget that one. I'll start that again. <clears throat> uh, I've worked on a couple of studios that worked with a. Co- yeah, start over. Done it again. That's fine. Hello, I'm a freelance musician who has been imported from Oregon to. <laughs> wait, wow, wait, you think Oregon. I wouldn't have never okay. talked on the? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Don't worry. It's been Don't a while. Fine. <laughs> oh, are we allowed to curse in this Isn't podcast? That, well, I, I prefer I prefer not to at this point. If we can. Family help friendly. It, but... Okay. <laughs> Greetings, I'm a freelance musician named Maserati, also known as Christopher Keith. I've worked on a couple of studios. Worked on? Why am I saying that? I've worked <laughs> with a couple of studios and recorded as a... Co- where I... <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Maserati, for talking with us about your involvement on Hunting Your... <clears throat> um, so let's go on to our primary topic, and that is what we feel is the direction of the Metroid fan... <clears throat> Franchise? That's not a word. Franchise. And franchise. A franchise. That's that's franchise. when fans take over and make yes. fanfics real. All there righty. we go. Quick <laughs> urban oh dictionary. God. Let's claim it. Now we've talked about how we see the future of the Metroid series, but we want to know what you guys think. Where do you think the future of the Metroid series should go? Use hashtag. Eh, let me just try that from the tar- top. Tarp. Top. Tarp. Whatever Tarn. word is. Tart. Words are a thing. Alrighty. Um, so let's go on ahead and discuss our. <clears throat> I got tongue tied there. So let me try that again. <laughs> He's losing a voice as well. <laughs> yeah, I had to do a. I had to do a lot of screaming yesterday in a in a podcast. Well, in a an audio drama I was recording. So I had to do a whole lot of screaming. That was fun. Uh, let's well, at, least, at least it's not as severe as a concussion that you. Had That's last true. Podcast. That's gone. That's long gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Scratchy throat. I can deal with. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Someone even responded, you know, quoting you, I hit my head. <laughs> That's fantastic. They did. I saw that. It was on Twitter, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. That is fantastic. All right. Well, thank you. That'll be like your catchphrase. That is going to be my catchphrase forever. I was like, I hit my head. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I hit my yeah. head. All right. Let me try that again. I'm with the two of you. Prime 4 is going to be life-changing i hope no i'm gonna i'm gonna start that again i was gonna say that might be a bit dramatic roy um <laughs> it will totally be life-changing it, it will change the it, world. it will be yes 
So again, thank you so much for listening and we will see you next episode. Or again, thank you guys so much for listening and we will... This podcast was edited by Torby Brand, with music by Maserati. If you enjoyed what you heard, please consider following our social media pages on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. For the latest Metroid news, community features, and exclusive content, check out the website at shinesparkers.net. See you next mission.